piece here, but we'll start up. Okay, so hello, welcome to welcome to Friday. Does that feel good? Yeah. Friday, everyone's everyone's okay. Work? Who has to work this weekend? Yikes! No, I'm very sorry for you all. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> it's nice to you know. If, if you're lucky, you get to, you know, when you're an adult, you get to the point where you don't have to work on the weekends. But I do remember, do remember going to university and having to work Friday, Saturday nights usually and not fun. No, I didn't party that much. I wasn't that cool. Sorry. I know it's, I, yeah, I know, I know it's hard to believe because I'm so cool now, but I wasn't. What's that? I know you joined a frat when you were in university. I never did. I never did. I kind of, when I was in university, I kind of, I missed a bit of it because I didn't go to university right after high school. I waited for four years and then I went. So I was kind of like not the same age as everyone around me. I was just a little bit older. And so the frat stuff I kind of missed, which I'm okay with because it's, I don't know, it's kind of dumb. But anyway, that's just my, that's okay. No offense. No offense to frat people out there. Um, so yeah, I'm sorry you have to work on the weekend. I know that, I know that stinks, um, but I also know, I know how that is, you know. And it's, it's okay. It builds character, as they say, right? <laughs> builds character, apparently. Um, okay, so, right, let's jump in to where we were. So, on Tuesday. On Tuesday, we finished watching this documentary, Your Inner Fish, right? And some of it was kind of apl uh, applicable to anthropology. Some of it maybe a little bit less. But I think there was some good background information, right? Particularly around how we're kind of related to other things around us and how sort of adaptations are passed on and evolve, right? So Neil kind of talked a lot about, he talked a lot about our hands, right? And one of the interesting things, sorry, I had to throw a picture of sesame, of sesame in here. Um, one of the interesting things is that, again, this is a, an animal that's very different from you and I. But when you kind of look at their skeletal system, when you look at their organs, when you look at their brain even, there are a lot of similarities, right? We have very kind of distinctive hands. Hello, come on in. We have very distinctive hands that, again, are going to be very useful for what I'll tell you today. Um, but again, those hands are kind of elaborated on from a very basic kind of skeletal structure, right? And you can see it. You can see it in all of these different creatures, right? There's, there's a horse and a cat and a bat and a bird and a whale. They're all very, very different organisms, but you can still see you know, we have similar bones, but the bones have kind of have different shapes, right? And they kind of attach slightly differently, but they are related, right? This kind of arm or limb that ends in five things goes back hundreds of millions of years, right? And it shows the evolutionary relationship we have to all of these creatures, right? And other creatures as well. Yeah, and so if you look at maybe a dog and if you look at us, different animals, right? Very, very different animals. But we have a lot of the same skeletal anatomy, right? Some of those, hey, come on in. Some of those bones have kind of remodeled and reshaped, and they kind of function slightly differently. Of course, we get around differently. Dogs are kind of running around on their toes. We're running around on the flatter part of our palms or our feet. I don't know what this human is doing. Hopefully, they're Hopefully they're getting ready to run a race. If not, I don't want to know what, what this is. <laughs> but, but you can see, but you can see the skeletal similarities, right? All the same bones are kind of present, right? And again, if we looked carefully at each of these bones, we see that they're slightly different shape. They have slightly different functions. They kind of operate differently with the bones around them. But in many ways, they're the same, right? And so we are we have evolutionary relationships. We have commonalities with other creatures on the planet, right? And we'll get into that today because we'll look at creatures that are much more similar to ourselves than, than dogs and cats, right? Um, 
One of the problems, one of the problems of teaching this class and then stopping teaching it for two years is that you have to kind of remember what you were going to say for each slide. And so this is one that I'm looking at and I'm uh, confused. a little bit confused. Um, we'll come back to this one. We'll come back to this one. I know what I want to say about it, but it comes later, okay? So um, pr primate, primate butt and human butt. We'll come back. <laughs> Come back to those later, okay? The, the butt will be important. Um, again, you can see some of the, some of the things that are very unique. Um, oh, that's what I was going to say. Some of the things that are very unique about humans have to do with our bipedality, right? The fact that we walk on two feet. And a lot of that has to do with our pelvis, right? So you can see here in, a, in an ape that moves around on all fours, look how long their pelvis is, right? It's really stretched out at the top there. But if you look at humans, it's actually quite short, right? And it's not kind of oriented this way. It's kind of oriented straight up and down, right? And again, if you look at this diagram too, you'll see quite a big difference, right? Apes and quadrupedal animals, animals that run on four feet, they have quite a long pelvis, whereas we have a short one, right? So again, when we see that, in the fossil record, when we see that in our ancestors, we can very easily identify something that's moving around on two feet, right? And sort of the more, you know, the more um, one of our ancestors looks like this and the less it looks like that, the better a biped it actually is, right? The more kind of it's evolved that adaptation. Yeah, that's what I want to say. Um, so, what I'd like to take you through today, and I'll, I'll try not to do, oh, I'll try not to go down the rabbit hole on this or, or get carried away. I do think it's really interesting. I did take courses on it in university, but again, I'm going to try not to bore you all to death. But it is an interesting story. It is an interesting story of how we move from something that looks very kind of ape or monkey-like to something that looks and moves like we do. And, Again, as we'll go through this course, I think we'll find that that question that I asked you at the beginning, you know, what makes a human unique, we're going to keep adding to that list. Everything you told me on that first day was correct, but we're going to continue to add items to that list. And so what we'll see is that we're, you know, very kind of connected and related to other living organisms around us, but we're also very, very unique we kind of, there's a lot of different parts of who we are and how we work that are just not very common to other creatures, okay? And so we are in some ways an animal just like any other, and in many other ways we are a very strange one, a very strange one indeed. Some of us stranger than others, but we won't go into that. Okay, <clears throat> so what I'm gonna walk you through here is just two very quick slices of time, okay? So what you're looking at is kind of an evolutionary family tree. And so if you look down at the bottom there, we've got the kind of appearance of the, or sort of a tree that is stem placental mammals. So these are mammals that give birth to live offspring, okay? And again, there's lots and lots of those mammals around. Almost every mammal that you think of gives birth to live young. There's only a few that lay eggs or that do some sort of weird pouch thing like kangaroos, but almost all of them are placental mammals. And you'll see here, around 50 million years ago is a creature that we've already met, Notharctus, right? We saw um, Neil Shubin referring to Notharctus in the video. And so we'll talk about that creature very quickly. And then what we'll do is we'll jump ahead, okay? So we have Notharctus around 50 million years ago, believe it or not. And then we're going to jump ahead to about 5 million years ago or so. And so in between this is kind of the period where uh, primates evolved from kind of tree-dwelling, long-tailed creatures, maybe something that looks like a lemur, to something that is standing on two feet and walking around. Okay? So there's a lot of evolution that's happening in here. Um, you know, primates here get kind of bigger, apes start to show up just before us. Um, where is it, where is it, where is it, where is it? I think right before our line shows up, 
apes start to appear, so kind of bigger primates. Um, but again, we're going to just jump ahead and we're going to look at bipedal primates and the other ones that have appeared before us. Okay. So again, it's a very interesting story. It's a very long one, but I'm just going to hit the highlights for you, okay? Because we don't have time to go into 50 million years of evolution. That's ridiculous. So before we start, I want to, I guess, caution you or at least kind of give you a context for how we know the things that we know. Because paleoanthropology is a field that is constantly changing, okay? And the reason it's constantly changing is because we are looking way back into the past, right? We're looking three, four, five million years into the past. And it's very difficult to try to figure out what was happening back then for a few reasons. And I just want to give you a bit of visibility on those, okay? Um, this is kind of a, the archaeology part of the course, if you will. So it's difficult to figure out what our family tree looks like for all of these reasons. Okay. Number one, it's a long time ago, right? Now, you know, I, I think maybe you're different than me, but for me, I find it very difficult to imagine f five million years of time, right? Because us humans were, we kind of live about a hundred years, don't we? There's no immortals in here, are there? Are any of you immortal? No, okay. Just, just there's one. Are, are you one? Are you immortal? Are you 300 years old? Um, we're very used to kind of thinking about things in 100 years, right? And so I think most of us could imagine 100 years, right? Where you guys are all about 20. You could probably imagine five times that length, couldn't you? Yeah, that's, that's, that's imaginable, right? Maybe you can imagine 200 years or 500 years, and it's we can kind of get our head around it, but five million years is a long time, right? I have trouble thinking about that length of time in my head, right? Because it's just, it's so long, right? It's such a long period of time. And again, humans aren't kind of, we don't really have that kind of experience with that length of time. And so things that occur over, you know, changes in species that might take 25 or 30,000 years to happen, that's kind of difficult to imagine, right? And so we kind of think about, you know, it, it, we kind of think about long things as kind of shorter than they actually are because we're just not used to thinking in such long time spans. And again, it's hard to imagine something that changes over 100,000 years because it's just so long. The second one is that the, the remains that we're dealing with here are very fragmentary. Right? So the bones are millions of years old. And even with something like Lucy, here's Lucy, who we met in, uh, in, the, in the documentary. That's everything we have of her, right? And that doesn't really look like a complete skeleton, does it? No, right? And fortunately, of course, fortunately, of course, mammals are bilaterally symmetrical, right? So they're pretty much exactly the same on one side as they are on the other. So you know, we've got most of her, but we're actually missing, we're missing quite a bit, right? And so paleoanthropologists have to put together these little crunched up pieces and try to figure out how they fit together, number one, and then how they work, right? How does the skeletal structure of this animal, what does it tell us about its behavior, right? How it moved, what it ate, right? How it might have reproduced. Those are big, big questions to answer with this kind of evidence. And again, paleoanthropologists are very highly trained. They're good at this. They really know what they're doing, but it's not easy. The other thing we're looking at here is that these remains are few in number, okay? So we have, we have specimens that we've dug up from the past. We saw the camp that um, Don Johansson was running in Ethiopia, right? They had a little tent and they were working away. And I think at one point in the documentary, he said that they had come up with the remains of 400 individuals, right? Which is good, right? That's a lot of, that's a lot of individuals. 
But keep in mind, he's been digging there for the past like 50 years, okay? So that's, what, what is that, 10, 10 a year? Eight, eight a year? So he's been digging there for a very long time. We don't have a lot of individuals. Every individual that we have is not a full skeleton. Okay, it's not like Lucy. And think about the time slice, right? So these 400 individuals might represent, you know, a million years of time. It's not really much, right? Can somebody, if somebody has their phone ready, can you, can you calculate something? Can you calculate a million divided by 400? Sorry, I can't do that in my head. I'm not a math guy. 25, okay. That means, that means that every individual in there represents 2,500 years, 2,500 years. So think about any one of us in this room. Is any one of us in this room representative of every human on Earth over the past 2,500 years? Right. That go, that's going back to 500 BC. Okay. That's Roman. That's Roman Republic. For those of you, uh, what's happening in India at 500? Is that Mauryan Empire? No. Nope. The Mauryans are the Mauryans are later than that. Mughal Empire? Yeah. So that's that's how far back we're going. So are you are you representative of every human on earth from the Mughal Empire to now? I don't think you are. <laughs> Neither am I, right? So that's actually not that's not a lot of individuals really, is it? For that length of time? 400 sounds great, but over a million years? It's not that much. Right? So we actually don't have, we don't have very much to, to work with here. There's another problem, and it's dating. And I don't mean Bumble or Tinder or whatever. Um, I don't mean that dating. I mean trying to figure out how old these bones are. Okay? Anyone heard of radiocarbon dating? Radiocarbon dating, C14? Yeah, what is it? Yeah. yeah, yeah. We look at we look at the isotope differences, the isotopes of carbon in a bone. We do a little chemical test, right? You grind it up, you put it in a spectrometer, I think, and it gives you a date, right? And you say, oh, this bone is twenty thousand years old, right? Which is great. It's very very useful. It's a very helpful tool. Works quite well. Lots of radiocarbon dates out there. The problem is, well, there's two problems. Number one. Radiocarbon dating really only works to about 40,000 years ago, okay? Because it's measuring the decay of carbon isotopes. After about 40,000 years, there's really nothing left of the carbon isotope you're trying to measure. So you, you can't tell. These guys are all hundreds of thousands of years old, if not millions of years old. So that kind of dating doesn't work. That kind of dating doesn't work. Um, the other thing is that these aren't actually real bones. These aren't real bones anymore. They're fossils, right? So they've undergone kind of a chemical process and the bone has been replaced with mineral. It's now rock. It's an exact copy of the bone, but it's not bone anymore. So you can't really perform the sort of typical radiocarbon analysis on it because there's no, you need organic material and there is none. There's a few other things you can do. There's like um, potassium argon dating and electron spin resonance and thermoluminescence, but we won't get into those because it's too much for this course. It's a few other things that you can do, but in many cases, what you have to do is you have to date it relatively, okay? So let me show you something here. Yes. Who here has a messy bedroom at home? You can admit it, it's okay. Do you have a sibling maybe, brother or sister who has a messy bedroom? That's a lot easier to admit to, right? I do, my sister had a super messy bedroom growing up. You can never see the floor. Um, so in bedrooms like this, whether they're ours or our siblings, 
what of course happens is that you know you clean your room and it looks nice and then you start throwing things on the floor right and so you throw your stuff on the floor on monday and then on tuesday and wednesday and things start to pile up right and so suddenly if it's saturday and you're looking for that thing that you wore on monday what do you have to do you gotta start digging down right and so it's the same thing with geologically speaking in archaeology right if you want something that's older you have to dig deeper right because the things that are have been laid down first are on the bottom and the things that have been laid down later are on the top right it's the same in nature as the messy bedroom however if you're looking through your bedroom looking for that shirt you wore monday that's five days but imagine if you had to go back four million years how deep do you think you have to go potentially a very long way, right? And it becomes kind of logistically impossible to dig that deep, right? Like you can't dig a kilometer deep hole to get down to four million years, right? It's expensive, it's dangerous, and you're probably not gonna find anything because the remains are so few to begin with, right? You just can't, you just can't do it. And so what you have to do is you have to go somewhere in the world where you can get to that layer, okay? So somewhere like here, uh, I'm going to draw this on the board if I've got a, what do, you, what do you think the odds are that this marker works? Probably not. Ooh, actually, no, it's a good one. Okay. So, oh, look at that. <laughs> so here's, here's all these layers, right? Here's all these layers. And I'm going to say that I'm going to say that's five, four, three, two, one. I'm going to say those are millions of years, OK? And so if we want to go back to four or five million years, we can't dig down, right? Because this is just way too far, right? It's like a kilometer into the a hole in the ground. You can't do it. So what you want to do is find somewhere in the world where you can get to certain layers, right? So what's happened here is that either glaciers or rivers or, or a, you know ocean erosion or something has kind of stripped away part of the landscape, right? All this has been kind of carried away in a river thousands or millions of years ago. And it's left all of these layers exposed on the edge, right? So now you can just kind of, I'm an artist, you can tell. <laughs> now you can just go with your shovel and you can go right into the layer that you want to look at, right? And that's what that's what Tim White was talking about in the video. And Don Johansson too, they're digging in that part of Africa because that's where you can get to those sections, those layers that are four million years ago. So you can't really dig everywhere because it's just, you just can't dig a kilometer deep hole in the ground. It's just not, not practical, not feasible, right? So, <coughs> Again, in doing this, you kind of have to, you can't date things perfectly. You can only date them in terms of, okay, we know, we know this layer is four million years old, so anything in here must be four million years. But we can't really confirm it for every piece of bone, right? And you won't get into this, but there's lots of geological processes where things can actually move from certain layers. So sometimes things kind of move up and down and they move out of the layer that they're supposed to be in. And then it gets really tricky, but we won't get into that. So you have to kind of go to certain parts of the world to find these things. And then you know, you're kind of limited geographically too, right? Everyone is digging in Ethiopia and the Awash or in the Rift Valley. And they're digging there because that's where they can access these layers of time, right? You can't do it everywhere in Africa, right? There might have been all kinds of human ancestors running around all, all over the place, right? But if we can't kind of, if we can't get to those layers, we can't see what was there, right? So there's lots of, there's places that we can dig and there's things that we found, but there's also places that we can't really dig. And who knows what's there? Maybe nothing, or maybe lots of stuff, right? So we're kind of limited to, as to what we can sort of get at. 
Um, let me just see. Oh, yeah. The other problem is the definition of a species. What did, what did we say a species is? From two classes ago, I think. There's a bunch of animals that can... They can interbreed with each other and... Right, and they can produce fertile offspring, right? That's how we know we have a species. But we can't really do that, right? All we have is a bunch of fossil bones, right? We can't tell who, you know, would want to be romantically involved with whom. Can't tell. How do we do it? Well, we kind of compare how the bones look. Do they look similar enough to be the same species or not, right? And again, these people are highly trained. They really know what they're doing. But also, you know, if you could, if this was an x-ray room and we could just turn on the x-rays and see everyone's skeleton, I know that would be a horrible invasion of privacy, but just imagine it. All our skeletons are going to look a little different, right? We're all kind of different sizes and heights. We're all built a little differently. We all have kind of different facial features and our skulls are going to be just slightly different different we won't all be identical so the question is we're all the same species I think we're all the same species but if you're just trying to compare bones it can be really tricky right especially if you're looking at maybe the same species but they're separated by 300,000 years right it can be really tricky and that kind of leads us into this is that some paleoanthropologists are called or they get called lumpers, and some get called splitters, right? So some paleoanthropologists, when they look at two things and they're trying to figure out if they're the same species, some people are very likely to say, yeah, they're close enough, same species. Whereas some are more likely to say, no, no, I think they're quite different. They're separate species. So some people have a tendency to just put things together and some people have a tendency to split things apart and say, no, we've got more species. Nobody really knows for sure, right? Because we can't, we can't interbreed these animals. They're dead and gone. So you have some discrepancies there too. So because of all these things, coming up with a picture of the past is really, really difficult, okay? And I think some paleoanthropologists like to say, it's kind of like doing a puzzle. You guys have done a puzzle, right? You know, it's a picture of the mountains or whatever it is. But these guys are putting together a puzzle that's millions of years old, right? They don't have all the pieces, right? Some of the pieces they have are, are broken or bent, right? And they don't really have the top of the box. So they don't really know, they don't know what the puzzle is supposed to look like, right? So they're trying to put together a picture of the past when they have no idea what it's supposed to be. And they don't even know if they're doing it right. right? There's, and so what we keep doing is every new discovery kind of sheds a little more light on what has happened in the past. And so it's very difficult to figure out what's going on. And again, the picture is still very much evolving. Okay? We really don't know for sure what the last five million years have looked like for us. But I'll try and tell you or show you some of the things that we do know, okay? So I showed you that, I showed you that, I showed you that, I told you that. I'll tell you one thing before we jump in here, and it's just a bit of terminology. So hominids versus hominins, okay? So hominids are things that walk on two feet, okay? And it does include... Um, um, it does include great apes as well. Okay, so gorillas and orangutans and chimpanzees and bonobos, they're all hominids as well. Hominins are things that are part of our genus. Okay, so anything that is a homo something, right? We're a homo sapiens, it's a homo something else, it's a hominin. Okay, just in case you see that term or those terms, that's what they mean. Okay, okay. so uh, yes. Very quickly, here's our good friend, Notharctus, right? We met Notharctus in Your Inner Fish. 
They're about 50 million years old, these creatures. You can see that they're, they are primates, but they don't really look like a monkey, right? They've kind of got a long snout, a longer nose. They look more, yeah, they look a lot more like a lemur, right? And they're not a lemur because lemurs haven't evolved yet, but they do look like a lemur for sure. Um, you can see they've got a hand similar to us, right? Five fingers and a grasping thumb. They do have a tail. And why we're paying attention to this guy, why we, or girl, why we care about them is that they are probably the common ancestor to all primates. Okay? So all primates that you can think of, lemurs, lorises, monkeys, baboons, chimpanzees, gorillas, humans, all have descended from this creature. And if not this creature, one probably very much like it. Okay? So that's kind of why we care about this animal. And again, we met them in your inner fish, so I'm going to leave it. I'm going to leave it there. But I just thought I'd start off with that. And then, of course, we're going to jump forward to about 5 million years ago. So as I say, through this time, monkeys, some, uh, some Netharctus-like creatures become more lemur-like. Some become more monkey-like. Some become more ape-like. Uh, and then there's a small line of apes that start to walk on two feet. And that's where we'll that's where we'll jump in, okay? So I'm gonna use, I'm gonna use this um, graphic here for our family tree. I suspect it is probably wrong, okay? Um, again, because we don't 100% know what happened over the past five million years. We're still putting the pieces together, literally. Um, but also paleoanthropologists disagree about things. They disagree about how many species there are. They disagree about what specimen belongs in which species. They disagree about who's related to whom, right? And so pretty much anything I show you here is gonna be wrong, <laughs> but, but it's, the best, it's the best we have, right? And again, as people keep working and digging and trying to figure it out, the picture will get better, right? But this is, this is good enough for, for us, okay? So you can see here it's color-coded, which I like. I'm a big color person. I like things to be colorful. And the colors have to do with the family groups, the genera of these animals, right? So you can see there's Artipithecus ramidus. We met Artipithecus in the documentary. It's an orange. Australopithecus, Lucy is an Australopithecus. They're all green. Homos are all in blue. That's us, we're homos. Um, and paranthropus, we'll get to, are purple, right? So it kind of helps us keep track of the sort of broad categories of creatures, right? And how they're, how they're kind of related to each other. But again, we're not entirely sure if this is correct. And again, it's probably not, but it's, it's good enough for now. It's the best we have, right? So I'm gonna start here with Artipithecus ramidus. I'm gonna ignore these two here. They're a little bit older, as you can see, maybe five or six million years old, but we don't have really a lot of bones from them. So this Auroran tugenensis creature, I think there's a mandible and a finger or something like that, and uh, Sahelanthropus chadensis, I think there's a bit of a pelvis and something else. There's just very little, right? So we, we think they're bipedal, but we don't really know much else after that. So I'm going to forget about them for now. They may, they may exist. We may learn more about them in the future, but I'm going to skip them for now. And go right to Artipithecus, right? So this was Tim White's, Tim White's Artie, right, who we met in the, the documentary. Probably the earliest thing that we have well, in sort of a complete fashion that walks on two feet. And in the video, we saw that it's anatomy was kind of interesting and it was kind of a blend of something that could walk on two feet but also something that was very good in the trees right and could climb around notice here the brain size if you will um, your brain is about 1600 cubic centimeters give or take that's how they measure brain and volume so this is a 
This is a small brain creature, right? This is not, this is not a rocket scientist. <laughs> this is a, this is an ape, but one that walks on two feet. Right, the side of the brain doesn't matter. It's like the, the wrinkles in the folds. The, the wrinkles in the folds don't matter, or they do. The side of the brain isn't important. The wrinkles in the folds It's a, it's a, well, it's kind of a, everything, right? The size of the brain counts. The wrinkles and folds count because they kind of increase surface area. The sort of neurons, how the neurons are formed also counts. So there's a little bit of everything going on. But this is a small brained creature. And, you know, similarly, it's, it's not a, it's not super smart. But, but yeah, the, the, the size is not the only variable there, for sure, for sure. Yeah, so we said or we heard about the idea that um, Artipithecus had a pelvis and limbs uh, and it had an opposable big toe, but it could walk on the ground, right? Not super well, right? Not nearly as well as us, not nearly as well as Lucy, but this thing could stroll around on the forest floor, right? Moved around on two feet on the ground, but up in the trees, it could climb, right? And it did this because, again, you can see it's got a grasping big toe. Right? It's got a big toe that can grab onto things, which again is kind of a strange feature for something that walks on two feet. But again, this thing is kind of halfway between the trees and the ground, right? And it's got, um, it's got anatomy that kind of makes it suitable to both, right? It's the pelvis. I don't think I have a skeletal picture of it, do I? No. Its pelvis has a short upper part, which is good for walking on two feet but a longer bottom part, which is better for climbing in the trees, right? That's obviously better for climbing the trees. Look at those long arms, right? Right down, right down to their knees. That's a long, <laughs> that's a long arm, right? Look at those big long fingers, right? Also good for curling around branches and swinging around, right? So this creature is, you know, has a walking ability, but it's still very much living in the trees. What's that? Best of both worlds. It's the best of both worlds, if you will. Um, here's a, a reconstruction of the skull of an Artipithecus. You can see here that we're actually missing, we're missing part of it, right? We don't even have the whole thing, so they've kind of filled it in. Also, if you're someone who's interested in the skulls of things, check out bone clones, because they sell you plastic reproductions of any the skull of any animal you can imagine. Um, and they're all kind of like scientifically cast, so they're totally accurate. If you're into that sort of thing, knock yourself out. What do I want you to notice about Artipithecus? Well, <clears throat> Artipithecus has some very kind of primitive traits that we don't have, okay? So I want you to notice first, it's big, big brow ridges. Okay? It's like a shelf over this thing's eyes. And if you kind of put your hand here, just kind of on your forehead, you'll see that we have a really bulgy, we have a really big brain, right? So here you can see that, here you can see that it's almost, it's really tightly constricted, right? You can almost like put your fingers right behind the eyes of this thing because it's got a really small brain and it's got a really big face. Right? And what you'll see when we get to humans is that humans have a really big brain and we have a really small face, actually. But at this point, small brain, big face, big brow ridges, okay? um, no chin, really. So all of us, if you kind of reach under your mask, you'll probably find that we have a chin that kind of juts out a little bit, okay? like from your teeth. But here you'll see that the chin goes straight down and curves. So a lot of our ancestors, all of our ancestors really, don't have a chin like we do. But if you look at those teeth, even though they haven't seen a toothbrush in quite some time, um, those teeth are not too dissimilar from us, right? Those are, those look like human teeth more or less, right? They're not, they're not dog teeth or anything. Um, in the documentary, Tim, Tim White was talking about the, the canines of this creature. And he said that actually they were very, very reduced 
they were very small, right? And so if you compare, yeah, here's the, the side view. Big face, small brain. Look at that big jaw, holy smokes, right? These guys have, these early ancestors of ours have a really big jaw and this here, this bone here called your zygomatic arch, you can feel it, you can feel it right here. There's kind of a little hole, so you can like reach your hand through behind here. And that's where your jaw muscles run up. So they attach to the bottom of your jaw, they go through the loop, and they go and attach to your skull like this. And so these guys have big jaw, big muscles, strong mouths to chew hard, tough things. Um, but yeah, small brain on top. So again, from the teeth, we can tell that this is an omnivore. It's not, it's not an animal that just eats vegetables. It's not an animal that just eats meat. It eats both things, right? It has a varied diet. But again, have a look at those canines, right? So here, I love these things. Um, this is a, a gelada that is, um, it is a baboon, I think, a type of baboon. But look at those canines. Holy cow, right? They're huge. And the canines are important because they tell us something about the social structure of the primate, right? So these guys have giant canines, not to mention the ability to flip their lip over their gums so that they look absolutely horrifying. Um, but they look that way in order to scare off other males because gelatas here they have a harem of females, right? And one male kind of mates with them and tries to scare away other males, and he uses his big scary teeth to do it, right? And gorillas, of course, have kind of the same social structure. But Ardipithecus, nope. Ardipithecus, of course, nope. There we go. Oh my gosh. Ardipithecus, look at those canines. They're tiny, right? They're basically the same size as ours, right? And what that's led paleoanthropologists to say is that, well, maybe we're looking at an animal that doesn't have harems, right? It doesn't have one male mating with a bunch of females. In fact, maybe these animals are pair bonding, right? There's one male and one female. They mate, they stay together, they raise their offspring. We're not really sure about that, of course. But either way, small canines is something that is similar to us, right? We don't have those giant baboon canines, right? We have canines that look like this, right? So Tim White made a big deal of those canines because that's a, that's a human trait. And even four, four and a half million years ago, Ardipithecus has those small canines, right? And so. Artipithecus may be a direct or a distant ancestor of ours. Not sure, but maybe. There we go. Here's, here's Lucy, okay? And we met Lucy in the documentary, right? At the time, she was the, she was the, oldest, the oldest bipedal primate that we had. Um, What I should say, she looks kind of cute, doesn't she? Yeah. So the picture, she looks like an old woman. I don't know. I think she looks kind of, well, maybe. She's kind of wrinkly, right? High cheekbones? Yeah. She's like a, she's like a model. She's beautiful. Um, <clears throat> pictures like this, and I'll show you a few more, but Pictures like this are kind of, they're kind of equal parts science and art, okay? So we don't really know what this animal would have looked like. Um, we have their skull, right? We know how primate muscles are kind of attached and, and what muscles primates have in their face. We know what primate skin is like. We know what primate hair is like. And so there's a little bit of science here, but there's also some there's some artistic license, right? We're not really positive that this is what they look like, but it's a lot nicer to look at this, right? A skull, it's kind of hard to 
imagine it as a, a real creature. But this thing, like we, we can kind of imagine seeing one of these animals, right? And kind of looking at it and having it look at us, right? So again, Lucy here is about, what did I say here? From about four to three million years ago, we have um, her species, Australopithecus, Lela, Australopithecus afarensis. Um, you can see she's got a slightly larger brain than Artipithecus does, but not really a significant difference in intellect here. Um, it's worth noting that most paleoanthropologists feel that Australopithecus has some evolutionary relationship to us. Okay, so she probably is a distant ancestor of us. This, let me introduce you to your great, 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 a hundred times over grandmother. Okay, here she is. But she's beautiful, isn't she? Beautiful. Um, what's that? No? Yes? I think she's beautiful. Come on. Um, Again, she's bipedal, um, Australopithecus is, but, but um, with a much more specialized bipedal adaptation, right? So her pelvis looks a lot more like ours, right? Artipithecus had that long, short top, long bottom. Her, her pelvis looks a lot more like ours. I think I've got a picture. Let me see. Nope, I lied. Okay. Her pelvis looks a lot more like ours. Her feet look a lot more like ours as well because Artipithecus had a big toe that could grab onto things, right? But Lucy's got one that's kind of in line with the rest of her toes. Her foot looks a lot more like our foot, right? Not exactly, there's still lots of evolution that has to happen, but all of her toes are kind of lined up just like ours are. So she's got a foot that looks like ours, she has a pelvis that looks like ours. The angle of her upper leg bones, her femora, is kind of like this. That's very similar to us. She has the small canines just like us, right? So she has a lot of similarity, even though, again, she's very ape-like, right? She looks, she looks like an ape, right? If you saw her walking around, she'd be quite small. She'd have very long arms, right? She'd still be very good in the trees. Didn't have that grasping big toe, but she's still got long arms so she can swing around up there. Um, so yeah, this is, this is a, something that is very sort of committed to walking on two feet, but still something that's very, very ape-like, okay? Um, yeah, so here's, a, here's an Australopithecus skull. And you can see some of, um, some of the features I was talking about. See how tightly it's pinched behind the eyes? Yeah, so she's kind of got a small brain back there. She's got that tight pinch. And again, that tight pinch is going to allow big chewy muscles that attach here to go through that arch and attach to her head, right? So she's got much more chewing and jaw power than we do. Actually, we have really wimpy really wimpy jaws, to be honest. Um, but again, those teeth don't look, those teeth look pretty familiar, don't they? More or less. They're roughly the same shape as ours. She has the same number of teeth that we do. Big, thick brow ridges, though. Most of us don't have those anymore, but um, guys, guys, you may be able to feel a slight bump on the front. Not all of you, and girls, you might be able to feel them too. It's not just guys. But you might feel just a little bit of a bump there. Most of you probably won't, especially if you're, if you're a woman, you'll probably feel that they go like straight down and then into your eye socket. So, a little, little bump there? Yeah, so I always have a little bump. Um, no chin, as you can see. Her Jaw just goes straight down. What else can I show you? Yeah, here's another one. Here's another one. Big face, right? Really big face. Small brain behind it. And really big jaws, right? These animals are chewing hard stuff, heavy stuff. Big jaws, big muscles, 
Big T. What's that? Probably a mixture of all kinds of things. So, probably leaves. Yeah. Probably fruit. Probably vegetables if they can find them. Roots. Insects. You know, I think if they if they found meat lying around, they would eat it. Uh, eggs from a bird's nest. I could see them eating that as well. Um, yeah, insects, larva, anything. These things probably ate anything they could come across. Okay. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Big face, big jaw, little brain. Yeah. This is an interesting thing too, and this this speaks to the bipedalness of Lucy. What you're looking at here is a museum exhibit, okay? But it depicts something that actually happened. And so we have, this was a place called Laetoli, and I think it's in Tanzania. And what happened is that a volcano erupted, right? It dumped a bunch of ash all over the ground. And then, and then a couple of Australopithecus animals walked through it. They left their footprints in the ash. It rained a little bit. And eventually, that ash basically turned to cement and fossilized. So we actually have this fossilized rock where you can see these Australopithecus walking through it. And again, they're not using their hands because you there's no hand prints. There's no stick prints or anything. They're walking through it just like just like you and I would, right? And so here they've kind of imagined, you know, a couple, a couple of Australopithecus in love. It's very sweet, isn't it? Well, look at them. Look at them. They're in love. What's that? No. We'll get to the idea of cavemen came from Neanderthals, but we'll get to them. We'll get to them. These are pre pre cavemen and women. Yes, all of these guys are extinct, of course, except, except us. Yeah. So, but anyway, it's an interesting thing to think about, right? These creatures running around, running around Africa, right? Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I really like these guys. I really like these guys because they're just so. There might be a little more artistic license here than science, but that's a face, isn't it? Doesn't that look like your dad when you like come home late? It's like, it's like, mm, right? Angry, angry dad. This is, this is per, this is Paranthropus boisei, and there's a few species of Paranthropus, and most people. Most paleoanthropologists would say that this is not an ancestor of humans, okay? And you can see that right in their name, para, like parallel, beside. Anthro is human or man, right? So it, they're parallel to man, they're beside man, but they're not our ancestor. They're another version of bipedal primate, okay? So here's Paranthropus boisei. You can see him running around from about two to one million years ago. Also worth pointing out, also worth pointing out, this was a pretty successful species, right? They, they're extinct now, but they existed for a million years. We've only been around for 300,000 years. Do you think we'll be around for another seven? Think we'll make a hundred, do you think we'll make it another 700,000 years? We'll see. <laughs> I hope so, but these guys were really successful, right? They were around for a long, 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 long time, right? Um, so as you can see, that's quite a face. Yeah? Um, is there a chance that any of our ancestors or whatever we're studying now, is there like any chance at all that they could have been born or developed like in similar to ours? No, but probably not, but we'll get to that. We'll get to that and you can, that question will be kind of answered by the end. Um, how, about, how about this, you wanna take a quick break? 
I feel like we're getting restless because it's been an hour. So let's take a break and then we'll come back and talk about this guy.
Okay. So. So. Okay. No, nope, gonna wait. It's still noisy. All right. So. Yet another bipedal primate, right? Probably not an ancestor to us, but another version of bipedal primate nonetheless, right? Again, these are similar to Australopithecus, but also not, right? They're a little bit different in terms of their, um, their skull anatomy, but also in terms of their skeletal anatomy. And so they're kind of like an Australopithecus, they're kind of like a Lucy, but they're much more thickly built, okay? So their bones are bigger, they're a little more muscular, they're kind of like football players of, you know, two million years ago, if you will. Um, and the kind of wild part about these guys is their jaws, okay? And so if you look at, here's a, here's a Paranthropus skull, which is quite a bit different than Australopithecus. Definitely doesn't look like a human, right? This is a very strange thing. And you can see what's happening. A couple things are happening. Really big jaw, okay? There's some really big teeth back here, which I'll show you in a sec. And the muscles that attach the jaw to the head are massive. And they're so massive that you can see that there's actually like a sail in the middle of the head, right? Because the muscles are so big that they need something to attach to up here. And so the bone has kind of grown into like a little sail so the muscles can attach. So this guy or girl has some serious biting and chewing power, okay? Um, again, this is a little bit dark, but you can see there's just these, uh, you're looking underneath, from the underneath here. You can see just really big zygomatic arches, they're called, big muscles going to the top. Look at those teeth as compared to ours. We have these tiny little, tiny little teeth. This thing has massive teeth, huge, right? Um, again, we're not really sure what this, what these kind of creatures were eating. Clearly something that was very tough that they had to chew quite a bit, right? Um, but again, it's what's interesting about them is that they're running around at the same time as Australopithecus and they're, similar to Australopithecus, but they're also different because they're so bulky and robust, right? And for a while, they were actually called robust Australopithecines. So there was gracile ones, which are kind of lightweight and slimly built. And then there's robust ones, which are really thick and heavy set, right? And so at first we thought there were these two kinds of Australopithecines. And then we said, oh no, actually it's two different genera. There's Australopithecus and there's Paranthropus. Okay? But again, there's these two variations and I want to point that out because interestingly it'll, that'll happen later on in evolution, but I'll draw your attention to that when we get to it. Yeah, so here's, here's an Australopithecus. Okay? Kind of a very you know, this is what you would expect from a bipedal primate. Really big face still, but and then if you look at a <laughs> If you look at a Paranthropus, again, there's some artistic license here, but you can see how, like, he's just beefy, right? Big and thick and big head and, again, kind of a very different, very different adaptation, right? Probably not an ancestor of us, um, but something that existed nonetheless, right? Yeah, so I'll, I'll draw your attention to this gracile, robust thing a little bit later. So I want to point out a couple things. We're going to start talking about the genus Homo, which is our genus, the, the more important one, I guess, for, for our, from our perspective anyway. But the other thing I want to point out here is that I've introduced you to a few of these different types of bipedal primates, right? So there's Artificus here, but then there's, you know, there's Australopithecus here, there's Paranthropus, and then there's our genus Homo. And so if you look, and it probably goes further back, but if you look starting around here, there's multiple versions of bipedal primate running around, which is kind of strange, 
at least from our perspective, because we're used to being kind of the only thing that's like us, right? The next closest thing to us are chimpanzees, and they're, they're not really that much like us, right? They're quite different. But here, starting around three million years ago, there are multiple versions of hominids. There are things running around that are kind of like us, but also kind of not. And that will continue all the way, really until about only 40,000 years ago, believe it or not. So, you know, we're used to a world where we're kind of the only human-like thing around, right? But the normal thing for the past three million years has been there's a bunch of different bipedal primates running around, which would be kind of weird, wouldn't it? Other species of humans, things that are kind of like us, but also not? That would be wild, right? We can't even seem to get along with each other when we're the same species, right? I can't imagine what it would be like to have other, other human species on the planet, but that was the normal thing, right, for a long, long time. So, without further, without further ado, definitely meet someone who is probably related to you, Homo habilis. Okay? So, as you can see, they're appearing around three million years ago. They're going to kind of disappear by a million and a half years ago. Big increase in brain size, though. Right? Artipithecus was running around three, maybe even 400 cubic centimeters. This guy's got a much bigger much bigger brain. And you can see that reflected in, pardon me, you can see that reflected in the skull, but I'll show you in a second, okay? Homo habilis, the first member of our genus. He's a homo, we're a homo, homo pride, right? Um, we can also see that Homo habilis is a little more like us in terms of their body proportions, okay? So Australopithecus and Artipithecus had kind of shorter legs and really long arms, right? Arms that were like, hanging down by their knees, because they were still up in the trees. But Homo habilis here is a little more like us, right? Our legs are a little bit longer, our arms are a little bit shorter, right? Because that's more useful for walking. The longer your legs are, the more efficiently you can walk a long distance. And again, you don't need, you don't need arms dragging around <laughs> at your knees, right? That's just awkward and pointless. So Homo habilis has body proportions that are a little closer to our own. And again, a brain that's getting closer to our size as well, right? So here's a homo habilis skull. Big difference, right? Still a big face, but that brain is starting to grow, right? We're starting to see something that looks a little more human. Still no chin, by the way. Brow ridges, but still not that really tight pinch, right? Not that really tight pinch. Those teeth, even though they look gross here, pretty human looking, right? Small canines, all the shape of the incisors looks very similar, right? Um, let me see what else I have here. Oh yeah, another um, kind of reconstruction of a homo habilis skull. Now, what's What's interesting about Homo habilis here is not just that he's the first species of Homo, but he's also the first one that we have been able to associate with tools, okay? And again, this is another unique aspect of humans that I think you told me about on the first day that we use, we use tools, right? We use items every day to live our lives. And that's gonna start with Homo habilis, okay? The first thing, and so Habilis is kind of, he's the handyman, right? He's the one who makes and uses tools. Not just men, women too, but still. So, would you, would you like to see one? Would you like to see the first piece of human technology? The first tool ever created? Are you ready for this? You're all sitting down? Yeah. Well, <laughs> it's not super impressive, right? bit of a letdown. It's kind of like, that's it. It's a rock, right? <laughs> let's, not, let's not get too excited about this. How even an anthropologist couldn't be possibly be excited about this, right? Um, and at first glance, it's really, not, it's really not that exciting, 
right? It's, it's a stone, looks like it's a broken one. So what, right? But something very interesting is happening here, okay? To make these, to make these, what you do is you find a particular type of stone, okay? And the problem is, is that not every, not every stone will work well, right? Because if you, you guys know what granite is, right? You've seen granite around? Yeah, so if you find a stone that's made of granite or something like that, you know that it's all chunky, right? It's all got little crystals and things in them. So when you break it, it's not going to give you a sharp edge. It's going to break around all those crystals, and it's not going to work. What you really want is something that's very kind of homogenous inside. It doesn't have much of a crystal structure, something that has a very high silica content. And so you can find these rocks, and really the best way to do it is to hit them against each other, because the ones that are kind of chunky, like the granite, are just going to sound dull. right? They're going to sound clunk, 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 clunk. But the ones that are smoother inside, they're going to kind of ring. They're all going to go bong a little bit. They're going to vibrate like that. And you'll know that you have something with a very homogeneous, smooth interior. And so when you find that, when you find that, you take that stone, and then you take another stone, a hammer stone, and you break off a few pieces, right? Maybe just like this. So these are, I'm sorry for my writing here. That's actually completely horrible. These are called flakes. This here is your core, okay? So there's a core, you knock off a few flakes, and bingo, you have a tool, right? And so Homo habilis first has to know how to find the right stones, right? He's got to bang them all together until he finds a good one, or she. And then learn how to break off a few flakes, okay? And then they'll have a nice sharp edge, which they can work with, okay? So you've got to know what material works best. You've got to know how to find it. You've got to know how to identify it. And then you need to know how to break this stone in a particular way. And there's, there's thousands of these that have been found, tons and tons of them, okay? And they're all made in the same fashion. They all kind of look like this. Now, first of all, what, what are they doing with these? Right? What is the point of a tool like this? How is it being used? Well, anthropologists kind of imagine this. They imagine that Homo habilis was actually a, an omnivore, so ate all kinds of things, but also may have been a scavenger. Okay, so if you can imagine the Africa of millions of years ago, lots of proto-lions and proto-leopards and things prowling around, and imagine a, a bunch of Homo habiluses coming across an animal that lions have killed, okay? And it probably looks something like that, okay? The lions are gone, having fed. They're gone, and Homo habilis comes to this, right? But as you can see, and as this, you can see by the look on this poor jackal's face, there's not really much left, right? There's not really anything to eat. The lions have eaten all of the internal organs. The lions have pulled the legs and hooves off this thing and eaten them all. And there's kind of just a head and a rib cage, right? There's really no, there's no meat left, right? And that's what the jackal is saying. He's like, what the, what am I supposed to eat here, right? <laughs> Nothing's left for me, but <clears throat> the jackal is out of luck, okay? The jackal can't do anything except go off and try to find something else, but the hominid has an advantage, right? The hominid has his little tool or her little tool. What can they do? Yeah, they can go and break open the skull of this animal, and inside is the brain, right? And most animals, like lions and tigers and things, usually their jaws aren't big enough to get around the skull of their prey, right? This is a wildebeest here. It's got a big head. Lions can't get their mouth around there to crack it open. So they tend to have to leave the head as it is. The brain kind of sits there, 
And then eventually, you know, bugs and beetles crawl in and eat it. And I know this is really gross. I hope none of you are eating right now. Um, it's very gross. But usually the brain is consumed by, by insects and worms and things because nothing else can get into it. But along comes this hominid with his tool or her tool. Breaks it open and suddenly has access to a food source that no other animal can get to. Right? And that happened before, right? With our hands, those early primates could get out onto the edge of the branches and access food that most other animals couldn't get to. And here it happens again, right? These Homo habiluses now have access to a food source that others don't, right? And so here they are roaming through Africa, eating, you know, larvae and insects and bird eggs and fruit and roots and vegetables and anything else they can find. And then when they come across a lion kill, they can crack open the skull and they can get at, they can get at the brains. And I know that sounds disgusting and it, and it does, at least to me anyway, it sounds gross. Um, but it's a very nutritious source of food, right? Brain has a lot of, brain is a lot of fat tissue right? Fat has a lot of calories, right? And so that's good for these animals. Is it going to help them to survive? Yeah, they have access to a food source with a lot of calories that only they can get to, right? Very useful, right? Very helpful in evolution. But there's probably more, right? If you imagine these hominids, these little hominids eating brain tissue, what does brain tissue have in it? What does it have? No? Um, what's really good for your brain that you want to eat? Yeah. What's good for your brain? Do they, have you ever heard them say it's omega-3s? Yeah. yeah, you want your omega-3s, right? Because they're good for your brain. And they are. Because lots of your brain tissue is made with those type of fatty acids, with omega-3 fatty acids. So you do want to consume them. They're good for your brain because your brain is composed of them, right? But here's this hominid getting a massive dose of omega-3s all the time, right? Do you think that's going to help with brain growth? Yeah, it's really good. It's good, for, it's good for brain health. It's good for brain development. And the access to this food source is good for this animal's survival, right? So this kind of very simple tool allows Homo habilis to access a food source that nothing else can get at, and it's a food source that's actually very good for your brain, right? But wait, there's more. There's more that's impressive about this tool because, I mentioned that, but even more important, Homo habilis is making this tool for a million years, right? So Homo habilis is around for a long time. There's thousands of these Oldowan tools that they've found. They all look like this, or the picture I showed you, basically. And so what's happening, right? What's happening is, is that this behavior, this skill, is being passed down, right? Homo habilis parents are making these tools and their little homo habilis children are sitting there watching them, right? And their little homo habilis children are learning how to do it, right? And eventually, those little homo habilis children have children of their own, and then those children learn how to do it. And so what are they doing? They're passing down this pattern behavior, right? They're passing down this skill. And even though that might not seem like much, that's kind of the very beginning of what culture is, right? There's going to be values and beliefs and things that come later. But at its most basic form, it's how do we do things, right? How do we, what skills do we have to interact with the environment? That stuff is getting passed down here millions of years ago, right? Again, it's very basic, right? It's a very simple tool. It's a very simple process, but it gets passed on for literally a million years, right? And it's kind of, again, the very beginning of culture, the beginning of transmitted 
patterned behavior. Right? And that's why that little rock, even though it's not very exciting, that's why it's actually a big deal. Right? It's a big advantage for Homo habilis. It's the beginning of us using tools as a species. And it's the beginning of culture. Okay? And also what we'll find is that as time goes on, the making of tools will become more and more important. Our tools will become more sophisticated. And as they do, the brain power necessary to kind of figure out how to make these tools and to actually control your hands, to have the motor control to do it, will help the brain develop as well, okay? Because these things, these things are pretty easy to make. I'm pretty sure all of you could make them. But as we get further on, closer to what Homo sapiens make, you guys can't make what they make. Their stone tools are incredible. And making tools out of stone may not seem like a big deal, but it's really difficult to do. And humans get really good at it. But that takes a lot of brain power, a lot of fine motor control, and a lot of ability to kind of predict how stones are going to break and what the steps to do it all. Yeah, did you have a question or? No? Okay. Um, yeah, so it's a big deal. This is a really big deal. Okay. Now we're really getting now we're really getting somewhere. Is so considered as um, probably not. Although they probably did live in caves, to be honest. I'll, I'll tell you about the cavemen in a bit. So here's here's Homo erectus. Okay, Homo erectus is an even bigger deal. Okay, as you can see there, they show up maybe a little less than a million years ago but they're actually around until almost 50,000 years ago. That's not long, right? It's long for us, right, for us humans, but in terms of the grand scheme of things, this five million year history, that's nothing, right? These guys were like just here a little while ago. So they last a long time. As you can see, their brain is significantly bigger than Homo habilis. Still, you should not imagine anything approaching how smart we are, but that's a bigger brain. Yeah. Uh, why did the Fernanthropus last longer than the Homo erectus? supposed to be smarter. Well, I guess the question is, uh, well, the answer is I don't know. Can but, you say both? well, that's the thing, right? Is that the speed of evolution can vary, right? So if the environment is rapidly changing, it's going to force um, creatures to respond and to evolve quickly as well. Could have to do with the fact that um, you know, the, the fossil record is biased. And so we might have a better record for certain animals than for other ones. Um, but I think, I, th I think probably what happened is the, the first thing. We have a period where there's lots of speciation going on, right? And so imagine, you know, the finches on the Galapagos that we saw in the video, you know, they probably hadn't evolved much for a long time until that population of finches wound up on the Galapagos Islands. And then they speciated very quickly, right? And suddenly we had 14 new species. And so, yeah, the environment will kind of play a role in terms of how fast or how slow these things occur. Yeah, but because they're smarter than um, not necessarily, because you can't control your own evolution unless you have genetic technology, and then maybe you can. But none of these animals can really determine how fast they evolve, right? They're, because remember the video we saw, most of evolution is, is random, right? Genes are being randomly recombined. Sometimes there's mutations, and then the environment will select the ones that are the most fit, right, for the environment. And so nobody can really control the speed of evolution, and animals can't control the speed with which they adapt, right? And many of them don't adapt fast enough, and they, they go extinct, right? So it's, there's a lot of randomness that can't be controlled, but I don't, think it's, I don't think it's connected to 
the intelligence of the species. Right? Or maybe we'll all find out together and we'll see if humans can evolve fast enough to survive. Maybe they actually were the same ones. They, they kind of evolved into us, right? That's a good question. So we'll, we'll get to that in a few minutes, but to, just to address your issue, the division between species is always difficult to identify, right? Because new species don't just appear, right? They slowly kind of transition from one species to another, and it takes a long time, right? So there's a period where, okay, they start off as one species, and then eventually another species has appeared, and animals kind of slowly evolved from one to the other, but where did they stop being one species and start being another one? Eh, nobody really knows, right? It's a very slow transition. And that's one of the things that I wanted to point out to you at the beginning is that it's hard to think about this stuff because it happens over such a long period of time. It happens so slowly, right? So we can't, we may know that we have a Homo habilis here and later we have a Homo erectus, but you know, the point where one starts to become the other, fuzzy, right? Are they, like, like, the same time that we just haven't discovered it yet? That's possible as well, right? We don't, we don't have the full, we don't have the full picture, right? We're looking, we're looking at the past through a little keyhole, right? And we can't see, we can't see everything yet. So, yeah, very true. Um, yeah, so Erectus is around, again, for a long time up to very recently, right? So we actually shared the planet with these creatures. Our Homo sapien ancestors probably bumped into Homo erectuses somewhere, right? So we've, our species has interacted with this one. Um, Homo erectus is a lot, um, is a kind of a big step up in terms of being close to us. Um, it looks a lot like us. It's got longer legs, it's got shorter arms. Homo erectuses are taller, right? They're closer to five, five and a half feet, so they're kind of modern human height. Um, they have ad adaptations in their legs for running, and we'll get to that later. I don't want to go into it now. I don't want to spoil it, but we'll come back to the running adaptations a little bit later. Um, here's a, well, part of a Homo erectus skull, and you can see that that brain case has gotten a lot bigger, right? On, on uh, Australopithecus, it was this tiny little thing behind a giant face, right? But now it's expanded quite a bit. Big brow ridges, right? Big brow ridges. And also really no forehead, right? That's worth pointing out too. So all of us, of course, if you put your hand right here in the middle of your kind of nose and you go upward, you'll find that your forehead kind of goes straight up and then it curves back, right? So we have a flat forehead and then it curves back into our skull. These guys, you'll see they've got a quick bump and then they go and they go right back, right? No real forehead to speak of, no baseball caps for these guys, it would just slide off their head. Um, very different shaped skull, but closer to, closer to ours, right? Here's a side view. You can see that they're kind of a little pointy in the back almost, right? That's the other thing about um, Homo sapiens that we'll see later is that we've kind of got a, we've kind of got bubble heads, right? We've got a really tall cranium. These guys have more of a football shape to them, right? Big, big brow ridges here. Still a pretty big face and big jaw, but nowhere, nowhere near the Australopithecus, right? No chin to speak of, really. But again, getting closer to something that looks like us, right? And again, to see them running around in real life, they would definitely look a lot more like us than, say, Lucy, who looked very apey. Now, the other thing I'll point out about Homo erectus here is that they have their own specific tools as well. But as you can see, although I kind of cut it off in the picture, their Homo erectus has gotten a lot better at shaping stone, haven't they? So this is called a this is called an Acheulean hand axe. And so it's named after, I think the place where they first found them was called Saint Achoule in France. That's why they call them that. But 
there's tons and tons of them. Wow, that did not come off the board at all. There's tons and tons of them, and they're all they're all kind of like that. They all kind of look like that, and they they're all kind of teardrop shaped. Some of them are kind of small; they fit in your hand. Some of them are quite large for some reason. Um, and our kind of idea here is that they were some sort of like Swiss Army knife of the paleoanthropological world, right? So you could dig with them, maybe. You could scrape things with them. You could cut with them. You could kind of do all sorts of different things with this one tool. Well, I mean, you could attack someone with anything. Um, we don't have any evidence of Homo erectuses attacking each other, so there's no Homo erectus skulls with like a hand axe stuck in them or anything. There's nothing like that. Animals? Cannibals? Animals. Animals? Eating Homo erectuses? No, no, no. Oh. Attack animals with that. Uh, let me see, let me see, let me see. Probably not. Probably not. So this is still, you know, sometimes we have this kind of stereotype or idea of like man the hunter right out there hunting animals but this is really before this predates hunting okay homo erectuses weren't hunting with weapons the way we kind of imagine them to okay uh, spears haven't been invented yet okay so putting a pointy thing on the end of a long stick too complicated not invented yet bows and arrows Definitely not, okay? So this is the height of technology. It is a teardrop-shaped piece of stone, okay? And again, I don't mean to take anything away from Homo erectus here, because even these are difficult to make. Um, I took a stone tools class in university, and we actually tr we went down to the lab one day, put our goggles on and our protective gloves, and we got some stone, and we tried to make stone tools, all of us modern Homo sapiens. And I almost got something that looked like a triangle <laughs> almost after like an hour and after like breaking a bunch of them in half homo erectus would have laughed at me they would have been killing themselves they would have been falling over watching me try to break this it's not easy okay what's that um we don't know we don't have their brains yeah Probably, probably in the same way that apes have emotions, you know. I don't think that they had melancholy, <laughs> but I, I think they were probably angry or excited or hungry, or you know, looking for sexy time or whatever it is. I think they were, they were probably like that. Marco, no, the sexy time thing. White. Okay, sorry, sorry. Sometimes I have to throw things in like that just to keep people, you know, awake and paying attention. Now, the last thing I'll say here about Homo erectus is, no, I'll say two things. One thing is that Homo erectus is the first hominid to leave Africa, okay? So all of these other guys, Australopithecus, Paranthropus, Homo habilis, Artipithecus, whatever else, they all live exclusively in Africa. But Homo erectus is the first one to leave, okay? And so you can see Homo erectus is in the yellow. So they they migrate out. Some of them stay in, in Africa, but they migrate out into other areas. And so you can see that they move into what's now kind of Saudi Arabia, in through the Middle East. They arrive in the Indian subcontinent. They keep going into sort of southern China and Southeast Asia. They make it into Indonesian islands and all the way, all the way up to Korea, right? And so these animals travel quite far from where they originally evolved. And that's important because they adapted to new environments, didn't they, right? They encountered new environments, new climates, new types of plants, new types of animals, and they learned, right? They learned how to exist in these new environments. And again, this migration probably took tens of thousands of years, right? Maybe hundreds of thousands of years, but still, they migrated out, right? The first ones to leave and find new habitats to adapt to. That's a big deal, right? That takes a lot of 
learning, right? The other thing that's interesting about Erectus is that they're probably the first ones to be able to create and to manage fire, okay? And that's a big deal as well, right? Because if you think about it, before this, none of those hominids could build a fire, right? And were probably terrified of it, right? If they saw fire, they probably ran away, like most animals do. But Homo erectus, being able to use fire, huge advantage. As a tool, huge advantage. It's cooks Yeah, right? It's yeah, right? So fire's great, right? Because it keeps you warm when you're cold. Very useful, right? It can keep away big, scary animals, right? If you're lost in the middle of the African savanna in the middle of the night, I suggest you build a big fire if you don't want to die. <laughs> so fire is very useful for scaring away other animals. And like you mentioned, Maya, it allows them to cook food, right? Um, were, they, were they smart enough to do that? Like, they, did. they did it. Okay. They did it. But they didn't have I, I think they were they had a more basic set of emotions than we do. I mean, you know, like let's think of well here, here's a question for you. Last thing we'll say. Still my time, sorry. Um, what kind of emotions do you think a dog has? They're happy? Sad. Angry? Angry. Hungry. Hungry. Guilty sometimes, <laughs> playful, right? Horny, sorry. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes they are. But I think, but I think that's probably what we. Could, yeah, well, that's yeah, maybe yeah. So we could probably expect those emotions from a Homo erectus too, right? Happy, sad, angry, hungry, playful, sexy time. What? No. So these guys are smarter. Anyway, okay, that's all the time we have. I know you're eager to get to your weekend, so I will let you go. Have a great weekend. Don't work too hard. Stay safe. I'll see you on Tuesday, okay? Okay.